Good afternoon, everyone. It's our great honor to welcome you all at this exclusive discussion with Mr. Deputy Minister Harry Huyen Chen from the Republic of China, Taiwan. Welcome, Mr. Deputy Minister. Thank you so much for being with us here today. And thank you very much, of course, for visiting Slovakia. My name is Alina Kutsko. I'm Vice President of Globsec and Director of the Globsec Policy Institute. The topic of our conversation today is uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the consequences of this invasion that go way beyond Europe and go all the way to Asia and other regions of the world. Of course, being here in Bratislava, we can feel and understand very clearly what the invasion means for all of us from the point of view of politics, economy and whatnot. But the implications go way beyond Europe. And that's why we also wanted to discuss with you, Mr. Deputy Minister, today what it means for you, what it means for Asia, what it means for Taiwan, and of course, how countries like ours can work closer together to find the right response to this aggression, but also to make sure that nothing like that ever happens again anywhere. For the participants who are joining us here, but also online, please mind that the conversation is broadcast live. And there is also the Slido app, which we encourage you to use to pose the questions. You can see the hashtag Globsec here on the screen, so please feel free to join the conversation online wherever you are. Mr. Mi Deputy Minister, I'm going to go first to you for your introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really an uh, honor and pleasure for me to be invited to the Globsec to have this uh, uh, exchange with you. Uh, you know, for Taiwan to be able to present our perspective, uh, this is always the opportunity I would like to cherish. Yeah. Here, uh, of course, uh, we have a very uh, important topic to talk about, but we all know uh, Ukraine is a very distant country from Taiwan. You may be wondering uh, why on earth uh, Taiwan is involved in this big picture after all. Uh, the uh, bilateral relations between uh, Taiwan and Ukraine uh, was actually not existent. Mm. Uh, before the war, uh, Ukraine probably uh, is a name that we only read in the textbook. Uh, only when uh, the uh, invasion uh, took place, all of a sudden it became the central news in the world. And I want to explain to you why Taiwan uh, was very early on drawn into this picture. Uh, it's because uh, before the war broke out, uh, Taiwan was already uh, in that uh, discussion of uh, how Taiwan resembles, uh, to a certain extent, uh, Ukraine. Th the reason I say that, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Putin, sees Ukraine as an inalienable part of its territory and the return of Ukraine a very important uh, step of uh, Russian rejuvenation. rejuvenation. Um, you will recall that Mr. Xi Jinping also sees Taiwan the same way that Taiwan is an, in his uh, words an inalienable part of the Chinese territory and the return of uh, Taiwan uh, would be a very important step of the so-called uh, grand rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Mm. So uh, with that similarity, even before the war uh, broke out in, in February, it was already a lot of association of how uh, if Taiwan behave as Ukraine, then it will be Ukraine uh, today and Taiwan tomorrow that Ukraine suffer and Taiwan will suffer the same way if we uh, like follow uh, the example of Ukraine. This kind of discussion uh, in Taiwan, it, you can regard it as a kind of a cognitive warfare. There is, a, you know, we don't know whom, but there was some driving force behind the scene to make this kind of story spreading. Uh, maybe for the purpose of intimidating Taiwanese people not to seek drifting away from China, even though at that time that was actually not the topic of the tongue. But uh, you must uh, understand uh, in Taiwan uh, a lot of disinformation is going on. 
and um, uh, part of this rhetoric uh, of uh, the similarity between Taiwan and Ukraine is because of uh, the very complicated situations between China and Taiwan. So, uh, to our liking or not, Taiwan was already in the discussion of Ukraine very early on. It's not out of our making and not necessary to our liking, but we were already there. So, uh, I remember uh, throughout uh, the year 2021, there was little uh, reported about Ukraine in our media. Uh, if I can recall, I think that in April uh, 2021, there was perhaps the first major mass of deployment of Russian troops. That was a time when Ukraine was reported, but only uh, you know, noticed by a, a small group of people. And then the sudden withdrawal of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan uh, in late August, again, uh, the Ukraine, uh, in under that kind of situation, what kind of repercussion would uh, spread over? That uh, is also the time we uh, Ukraine was reported uh, in Taiwan. But then, uh, into uh, 2022, January this year, all the situations changed. And uh, it was reported in such intensity that uh, any big change can happen any time. And so uh, we started to pay a very close attention. And here, as I'm working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have many internal discussions looking at possibilities and how we should respond. And of course, you would uh, you will recall, uh, before the outbreak of the invasion, there was a Winter Olympic held in China and Zhang Jiakou, in Beijing and Zhang Jiakou. The first day of the Olympic was the 4th of February, and it concluded on the 20th of February. There was something very important happened on the opening day, on the 4th. That was a signing of the joint uh, statement between Putin and Xi Jinping. And uh, Putin didn't even bother to stay for the grand opening of the Winter Olympic. He just flew back to Moscow uh, with a heavy harvest. He already got a lot he aspires in the joint uh, statement. Then, uh, of course, the Winter Olympic uh, went on with a lot of speculations what is going to happen in Donbass. Then uh, it concluded on the 20th. The first, the following day on the 21st, it was the independence of Donetsk Republic and Lugansk Republic with the immediate recognition of Putin. Mm. And uh, three days later, the invasion uh, took place. It's very difficult for uh, we in Taiwan to see no understanding from the Chinese that uh, the there was a uh, design in a way that the outbreak would not happen when the Olympic was on. Exactly the same in 2014 when the Winter Olympic in Sochi. Uh, right after the conclusion of the Sochi Winter Olympic, it was the annexation of Crimea. It was the same kind of uh, uh, you know, design or strategy. So um, we think that uh, the significance of that will mean that China uh, pretty much uh, have an uh, understanding something is going to go on. May not be the case that Putin told Xi Jinping what he wants to do in uh, Donbass. But I think uh, if some kind of message uh, I along with that, just don't worry, uh, you, you can go on with your uh, uh, fanfare uh, in the Winter Olympic, uh, but up after the Winter Olympic, uh, we hoped to have your support, things like that. And so uh, when the war broke out, uh, because of those uh, spread of the news before the war in January, 
uh, with Taiwan uh, similarly uh, similar to Ukraine. So you you see a, a kind of uh, a personification of Ukraine in Taiwan. We have the kind of uh, sentiment feelings among the Taiwanese people that uh, we uh, must side with Ukraine. And it happened uh, almost immediately when the war broke out. So um, the next day on the 25th, we already issued a national statement to join the international effort to condemn and impose sanctions on Russia. And three days later on the 28th of February, February only had 28 days, and that is a national day of Taiwan on the 28th. So we have a long weekend. That was Monday. We have a long weekend. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we, uh, we didn't waste any time during that long weekend to come up with the first air load of uh, medical aid to go to Frankfurt and from Frankfurt uh, land transportation to Warsaw. Why Warsaw? Because uh, it so happened uh, Warsaw uh, is the place that accommodated the most uh, Ukraine refugees. And out of the humanitarian concern, we want uh, to help them as early as possible. That, w that was uh, February. And then in March, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs again set up a bank account to accept a small sum donation from our people. And just one month, we collected uh, more than 33 million US dollars uh, from our, our people. We started to use the money to channel them to different cities, different neighboring countries of Ukraine, including Bratislava, including your country, to help the uh, refugees. The same time in uh, March, uh, we also uh, have a campaign for in-kind donation so we, uh, in three, three weeks, we collected uh, close to 600 tons of goods and materials. They were packed uh, in large and small size of boxes, 31,000 boxes of them. I can be so precise bec because we send them by DHL. A lot of them come <laughs> here. <laughs> and, uh, I tell you the quick response from the Taiwanese people, but that's all in the beginning phase of the war. Uh, of course, it's a different situation now. It's, it's, it looks like uh, not moving too much, but uh, we are already uh, uh, talking to friends, including uh, your government, uh, what other contributions can Taiwan do? Uh, or um, to what uh, extent we can be part of the reconstruction, but this is uh, 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 this is uh, something, some effort, international effort that uh, can start uh, after the conclusion of the war. Well, uh, I must say that uh, from Ukraine, we uh, we uh, start to see the uh, emergence, it's not really the emergence, but the, c the, the st stronger demonstration of how uh, two rivaling camps are confronting each other now. It's a democratic camp versus the non-democratic camp. And uh, we, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, by nature, we are a democratic country so it's not because of a calculation that uh, Ukraine is going to win the war. We sided with them. It's because we share the values. So uh, we are uh, with Ukraine from the very beginning. Uh, we think that uh, this trend of two rivalry camps, uh, even though it's not entirely uh, the so-called uh, ideology uh, confrontation, but it is very much a difference in good governance. It's a democracy versus non-democratic countries. In this case, it's more than just authoritarian. I think this is the dictatorial, um, autocratic system. Uh, we uh, want to work with like-minded countries, and uh, Slovakia is one of the like-minded countries that uh, we share the values of uh, 
freedom, democracy, respect for human rights, and rule of law. So this is actually one of my message that I carry along in my European tour. And um, I, uh, I always think that it's better to open to uh, the Q&A because uh, when I ramble on like this, I can very easily get lost. So <laughs> why don't I just uh, stop here? I welcome your, your, your question or your comment and you will be helping me to uh, reconcentrate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Minister. You. It was a very powerful introduction. I'll encourage, of course, everybody in the audience to raise hands and I'll get back to you. And while people are thinking about the questions, I want to follow up on what you just finished with. And there's this confrontation between two camps, uh, how you summarize that some of them have good governance and the other camp doesn't have good governance. We see, of course, a lot of it also happening in Europe and throughout the world. But can you tell us a little bit more how this confrontation already changes Taiwan's relations with other countries in Asia? Has something changed? Uh, does it affect your relations within the region? Or it's more about the outside relations with the rest of the world? <coughs> I, I have been in the foreign <laughs> service for more than 30 years. Um, you know, uh, never before have I sensed uh, the drastic change of international relations can be happening just in front of your eyes until uh, very recently. I think Ambassador uh, Nakagawa uh, um, may also have the kind of uh, experience that uh, everything is changing very quickly in front of your eyes. And uh, in Taiwan, Yes, uh, the change um, started from, in our view, uh, there is the Xi Jinping's uh, second term. Uh, you know, uh, there was a party congress, 19th party congress in 2017. I was uh, head of Taiwan mission in Brussels uh, in 2017. When I went to Brussels, the atmosphere in the China discussion was very different from three years later when I left. There are so many things happening uh, in, uh, in EU uh, and, and you see that uh, a different approach of the Chinese foreign policy and a different evaluation of Taiwan or the role Taiwan can play in this picture. And a growing uh, concern of uh, the, the Chinese ambition and, and how much that can affect international relations, uh, say, if uh, EU um, is here in the picture, uh, how uh, much a potential um, threat from China compared with a potential threat or real threat from Russia. Things like that has been under discussion uh, in the past few years, and it's only getting more and more prominent uh, in uh, international relations. And uh, in the Indo-Pacific as well, uh, we see uh, there is a, 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 you know, a policy shift in the U.S. government when President Trump was in office. President Trump, uh, of course, has a very strong character, not necessarily to the liking of the gentlemen and ladies here, but uh, he introduced uh, a policy shift. We must... Uh, we must be frank that a lot of his policies toward China was succeeded by uh, President Biden. And there must be a reason for that to happen because these are two presidents from entirely different political uh, parties in the United States. So there are a lot of things happening. And Taiwan's you know, place in this picture is because of uh, the real threat that we face from men in China. And um, uh, I see a consolidation, a consolidation in the Indo-Pacific, strengthening uh, the like-minded countries uh, to and to encourage working with each other. And I think that is the trend to go on. Thank you so much for bringing up also the American increasing pivot uh, mm. towards Asia, but also right. crystallization of understanding what mm. kind of forces are juxtaposed in Asia. And I want to connect it to one of the questions that we have from the audience, and that's about the role of NATO in the Pacific. Mm. Do you think that NATO should be more involved in the Pacific? And if so, in which ways? 
I think so. I think uh, there there is a there is a uh, an argument um, to see that NATO uh, may be uh, in becoming like uh, there is an in Indo-Pacific version of NATO. Let, let's put it that way. There there is recently there is a summit NATO uh, summit inviting non-NATO uh, countries to join uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Well, uh, this, is, uh, this, this is not business as usual for, for NATO. So the concept of collective security, the concept of Article 5, uh, is perhaps not only confining in uh, the European theater now. There is, there is a sense of uh, um, the, the whole world, uh, as I said, uh, the, the is getting into uh, a division of uh, political uh, governance, models of governance. So uh, yes, uh, if the concept of collective uh, security, uh, which is the essence of NATO, can apply to uh, Indo-Pacific, that is something that we would welcome in Taiwan. And uh, the reason that is happening, I think, is because um, th there, is, there is something uh, called, uh, uh, we, we call it a, a, a you know, uh, fr friend shoring. Friend shoring uh, is uh, to uh, do business with uh, the countries that have strong adherence to a set of norms and values uh, in terms of uh, uh, international economy or in terms of uh, how to operate uh, in the international economic system. So it is, uh, there used to be a time when there can be a separation of uh, politics and economics. Now that uh, fine line is dis disappearing. So. Uh, I think that is a very important underlying reason for NATO just to look beyond uh, Europe um, and then moving on to a global theater. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's exactly the discussion here, mm. that no longer you can separate politics from economy, from mm. the security situation, not just in Europe, but in Asia as mm. well. Mm. And so I'm going to take a question from the audience, gentlemen over there. Expecting to have a warm, and now we have expecting to have a warm summer because there is a power struggle in China between uh, Prime Minister Li Keqiang and uh, President Xi Jinping. So, how do you think this will influence uh, the the security situation in the region, and what are the scenarios Taiwan is preparing for? Thank you. And we'll take two questions at the same time, so please pass the microphone to the front. I'm Peter Osuski. I am vice chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National Council of Slovakia. And it was just mentioned about the uh, disappearing of the division line between business and politics. Uh, now we are standing in Europe in front of, set to say, the buckle of the traditional German version, Wandel durch Handel. That is now in ruin. And the same is the case. We are now standing in front of China. I am sincere, strongly opposing any new Silk Road, because by new Silk Roads, we are supporting economically and also politically the most worst enemy of democratic world today. Because Russia is, at was said, upper volta with rockets. But China is much more and much more dangerous, the red China. Thank you so much, Mr. Minister, back to you. <laughs> I, I, I am not sure I would describe the relations between Xi, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang as a power struggle, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, Xi Jinping, at least looking from outside, uh, he has 
no clear uh, challenge from inside the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, would you say that uh, uh, he is um, he is obviously a paramount leader? He is probably most likely going to sail into his third term without uh, any hiccup. But that doesn't mean that he is the most popular figure, political figure in the Chinese Communist Party. Because uh, for one thing, in the past so many years, he used uh, the so-called fighting corruption to have purged so many of his political enemies. He has created so many enemies. And that is one reason he has to cling to power. Otherwise, <laughs> it's a matter of life and death for himself. If he is not in power, he will be in trouble. It's not safe for him. But uh, let's, let's look at it this way. Um, you know, there is a natural allies of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, there is only this many positions uh, to be in the standing committee, to be in the Politburo, or even to be uh, in the central committee. It's, 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 you, can, you can just count the number. So for a lot of uh, party members who are senior enough but not lucky enough to take those important positions, they will settle down with uh, the businesses. They would have their uh, connection to the business, so they don't have power, but they have a lot of money. So that's the so-called Prince Lin. Prince Lin is one of uh, the natural allies of the ruling uh, leadership in the CCP. Then another natural allies is the so-called startups, uh, the Jack Ma and other uh, important entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, or uh, the big uh, uh, top uh, businessman uh, who is the tycoon of the real estate, uh, uh, you know, industry, things like that. But uh, you just look uh, back into the past one or two years. These are all the people who suffer because of Xi Jinping's policy. And so um, they were not able to come up to protest against Xi Jinping because their, um, their political system is so in, uh, non-transparent. And you, you, you can only speculate from outside. But um, what is happening in China now, I will urge you to pay close attention that uh, if there is uh, village and township banks uh, are not able to uh, allow the, the, the people uh, who to, uh, come to withdraw from, from their own deposit, that really tells you something. And if uh, their uh, real estate uh, uh, tycoon, Mr. Xi Jatun, if uh, they are uh, uh, not able to uh, deliver the, 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 the unit. Mm. That tells you something that China's uh, economy is in big trouble. So I think there is a uh, big uncertainty in China. Uh, even though I, I, I think that Xi Jinping uh, is now more, uh, uh, perhaps uh, much more a strong man than, Xi Jin, than the Chairman Mao Zedong because he has the digital tool to control his people. But that doesn't mean that uh, he can sleep uh, well and doesn't need to worry about uh, people who will come to nail him down. And, and as for uh, Chairman uh, Osuski's uh, comment, I, I agree with you. I think the uh, analogy of Silk Road uh, it's e easier to understand if you look at the Chinese Belt and, and uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It was once called One Belt, One Road. <laughs> and one Belt, One Road is a Silk Road. <laughs> and and uh, the, the things happening in Sri Lanka is because they take the easy money from China. Again, uh, under the Belt and Road Initiative, just like under the One Belt, One Road Initiative. <laughs> It's, it is not transparent. Uh, easy money to be lended to any government 
and you uh, have no way to monitor how that money was spent. So uh, people call it a debt trap diplomacy. And there are so many countries already in the debt trap. Sri Lanka is only uh, one of them. There are also a few from uh, European uh, continent. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that is something for us to, to pay attention. This is definitely something that also Western leaders thinking more and more about, also in terms of offering support for developing countries so that they don't have to turn to Chinese easy money. But I want to follow up with another question from the audience. You mm -hmm. told us a little bit how during the uh, early days of the Russia's invasion and before that, there was this narrative spread in Taiwan that China might invade as well. Can you tell us a bit more about the public mood in Taiwan right now? Do people prepare for the Chinese invasion? Or if so, would they the mood is that people are ready to fight or is rather of fear? Uh, it's already uh, been uh, re repeated many times that ch uh, the China uh, would not, China would not uh, renounce the use of force against Taiwan. They, they want a unification, this is written. And as I said, uh, they see it as a very important part of the national rejuvenation. But uh, if we see the threat uh, only from the military conf conflict, we may be missing the picture. Of course, we don't want a war uh, to break out. That's, uh, that's you know, uh, everything will be ruined if there uh, uh, was a war. But uh, short of a war, there's real uh, threat happening uh, in Taiwan and across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, you, you have heard a lot about this information campaign. You had heard a lot about uh, gray zone tactics. The China using, uh, I, when I say China, I mean the Chinese Communist Party. I don't want to antagonize the, the people of China because they are not necessarily supporting the Chinese Communist Party. They only have no tools to rise against. And so uh, what is happening in Taiwan is that China is using, uh, uh, taking advantage of the weakness, so-called weakness of democracy and the free society. We respect freedom of speech, freedom of press, and China is using that as a way to penetrate into Taiwanese society. Uh, they, they always uh, have a small a group of people they target, they try to help uh, this group of people to become more prominent in business or in politics. A in a democratic system, uh, there is uh, you know, transition of political parties in power. So when their sympathizers are in place, then they think that it's the time for them to come. So it is to the Chinese uh, Communist Party, there is a cheaper way uh, to to take Taiwan back. And that is very dangerous for us. We are, st we are preventing that from happening. And now wh what is important in Ukraine, in our view, is um, the way Putin suffered from making that big mistakes, moving to Ukraine. I think it, uh, it would you know, make Xi Jinping uh, to think twice before uh, he used force against Taiwan, after all. What is happening in Ukraine with the Western solidarity can well repeat itself uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of um, you know, proof or evidence of that. Uh, a comparison of Taiwan and the Ukraine, et cetera, is one, one way to, to see that. But the relations between the US and Taiwan uh, is strong enough for me to be confident to say that. O on that note, there is also a specific question that concerns your thoughts on the concept of strategic ambiguity that US tries to promote right now, basically saying that we're not going to disclose what exactly we're going to do if something happens. What do you make out of it? <laughs> uh, 
No, we are not promoting strategic ambiguity. I mean, Americans do. <laughs> uh, it's, it's the U.S. policy, and it's up to the U.S. to say uh, whether that is ambiguity or clarity. We, we think from the Taiwanese perspective, we, we think actions speak louder than words. So we are working with the U.S., and it's very important the U.S. is our ally. As, as uh, the Japan is also helping Taiwan to defend ourselves, but uh, there, there there are many evidences and and th there are arguments from the academic and from the think tank like you to see that China, uh, the uh, United States is moving uh, out of ambiguity into clarity, but we cannot comment on that. It's for the U.S. officials to to describe their own policy. For, 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 for me or for the ac academia, I think uh, you have seen the US and the EU's response to Ukraine. They, they said from the very beginning, they probably are still saying that they would not uh, you know, fight uh, with the Ukraine, it's for the Ukraine to fight it, but they are coming to help Ukraine in any way possible. You probably don't find the U.S. soldiers <laughs> in the Ukraine troops, but other than that, you, 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 you have seen the U.S. weaponry systems used in the warfare. Yes. So um, I think uh, in politics, uh, saying it's one thing, doing is another. It's always like that. More important uh, one. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much for that, and we'll take a question from the audience. Gregory Mesejnikov, Institute for Public Affairs. Dear Deputy Minister, dear Ambassador, my question is about prospects of relations between the European Union and Taiwan. Last year, we had good signals and really very important steps done. Uh, delegations from EU member states visited Taipei, Delegation of European Parliament even, I think that such a representative delegation first time visited Taipei and European Parliament pro, uh, passed their special resolution in support of strengthening relations between EU and Taiwan and the special document, strategic document was prepared for European Commission uh, in this direction, but at the last moment it was postponed. Uh, the deliberation was postponed. So my question is, uh, what now is the status of this document? Whether you are getting some signals from the European Commission that this document will be again discussed and approved? Uh, you know, uh, there are so many resolutions passed in the European Parliament, as you indicated. Uh, a, a policy is there. Uh, when the policy is going to be delivered into a reality is always another matter. Mm. And then th th this is a very complicated world. Uh, you want something good to happen, but you don't want to uh, ups so-called upset the apple cart. You, there is a lot of uh, different aspects of the matters that you want to take care. So uh, we are very uh, happy that uh, EU and the European Commission and the Parliament have come to realize that uh, there is a need to reinforce uh, their relations with Taiwan. And because working with Taiwan is working with like-minded partners. So, uh, and uh, also to emphasize the possible um, uh, repercussion from uh, China if they continue their very assertive uh, foreign policy. Um, so uh, it's something that we appreciate very much. We have seen uh, a lot of uh, p policy enunciations in the, uh, in the resolutions. Uh, we understand that uh, it would wait for a very optimum time uh, for things uh, to become a reality. And then there is that it's a very good direction. We work uh, in synergy. 
Thank you so much for that. I know you mentioned that uh, Taiwan is very interesting to help with the Ukraine's reconstruction. And uh, already a lot of countries are trying to draw up plans, who is ready to contribute with what, so that when the time comes, we have everything in place, not to waste any time. Are there any specific areas in which Taiwan is interested to contribute? Um, for example, now there is a lot of discussion that countries take patronage of a particular cities or region or sectors. What do you think would be the best way for Taiwan to contribute in more details? I think the discussion hasn't come to such details yet. Uh, it has to be an international effort because uh, we, we know the role Taiwan can play. Uh, we don't want to exaggerate that uh, we can make a huge uh, you know, contribution. But uh, the, uh, when the time comes, we already have the invitation to join the international effort. And uh, the way we uh, play a part of it would also be uh, very cautious. Um, we will be working with like-minded countries like you or other uh, EU member states uh, on, uh, on certain platform. The, the, the point is to uh, show that we can work and we can help in these important issues. But as to how we can conduct that kind of policy, it has to be uh, very cautious. Let me put it that way. Thank you so much. I will go back to China. Um, according to Globsec Trends, that's the opinion poll that we are running here in the region. According to the opinion poll this year, 61% of respondents in Central Europe in this region do not perceive China as a threat, which is probably for you something uh, rather puzzling finding, but the awareness of the Chinese activities is very low in the region. What would be your recommendation for decision makers or engaged citizens in the region? What kind of Chinese activities do you think we're not paying enough attention to? And what is the best way to start building up this awareness? Well, uh, I think political leaders have to see things differently from the common people. Uh, that is what leadership means. And then, uh, the fact that uh, China is working with uh, EU, trying to uh, encourage EU or the EU member state uh, to have your own strategic uh, autonomy. Mm. It's it shows that China doesn't want to see EU and the US work uh, in synergy. There is always something that China can uh, present to you because they have a very attractive uh, market. But uh, that market, again, um, poses, uh, let's, let's call it a moral hazard. Now, if, if you only want to make money, um, that's the way you choose. But if you think that uh, the money uh, has to be consistent, the money you make has to be consistent with uh, the, the, the value you believe, then that's another matter. So uh, the, fortunately, the trend of the world is what I just said, that um, the separation between politics and the economy is getting more and more blur. The, you, unlike uh, the years ago, we are still able to uh, no, appeal to our conscience and then say we are only making money. This uh, the, the trade partner I, I deal with has nothing to do uh, with me. But I, I think uh, it is not like that uh, when the Chinese record in human rights the Chinese uh, way to behave uh, in terms of supply chain relocation is all uh, in big question. Uh, I want I want to uh, I want to remind you that uh, if you only care about making money uh, in China, uh, they they used to be able to produce most of the face masks in the world. Uh, at the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19 to the extent that when the uh, pandemic uh, broke out in your part of the world, 
you are in such a great barrier, in such severe shortage, you don't have anywhere to get the masks. But China uh, didn't offer any to you because of uh, their own uh, problem at hand. They are not only doing that, they, are, they went out uh, to, to grab, to buy out all those available masks. Now, if you deal with a friend that has a different value with you, that is very likely the kind of situation you face because you are over reliance on a partner which doesn't share the, your value, who is not uh, trustworthy. But the, the same logic applies when there is a, a supply chain relocation. You want to find someone trustworthy to, to, to do business. I, I, I think that that is the trend and the people and the countries are paying uh, attention to that, that trend. Thank you so much. And another question from our audience. You mentioned already that China has other ways to take control of Taiwan than military means. Mm -hmm. And the question is, uh, what can the West do more to support Taiwan to build economic resilience? Mm -hmm. uh, I say China has other approach. Try to take uh, over Taiwan. <laughs> it's not that they can take over Taiwan. And, uh, Again, um, I think the, the, the awareness of the people is very important. And uh, you, uh, a, a few years ago, you probably will still see the Taiwanese people identify themselves as Taiwanese and Chinese at the same time. Now you don't see that. Uh, then most people in Taiwan will see ourselves just Taiwanese. Uh, it is because of what China is doing. Um, China is driving Taiwan away. Uh, no, the, the, again, uh, there was a time when China thinks the only way to uh, unify Taiwan is the, the shortcut is to win the minds and heart of the Taiwanese people. They want, they once were thinking it in that kind of, uh, in that kind of manner, but um, there is a change in the Chinese politics. Uh, when they started to see that uh, just to appear to the minds and hearts of the Taiwanese people, they are getting nowhere. So uh, the, the rhetoric in China is perhaps uh, military approach is the only way possible. So they, they, in a way, they are, uh, they are creating a kind of nationalist sentiment in China. That is very dangerous. That is very dangerous. And... Um, because Taiwan is not defenseless, and Taiwan is not alone. We we have uh, international assistance, and we we have uh, our border is a uh, Taiwan uh, strait. Unlike in Donbas, there is no uh, obstacle at all. So they 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 know it's it's not easy to to in invade Taiwan. Otherwise, the Communist Party wouldn't be. Uh, showing that kind of goodwill. Otherwise, th they would have already tried decades ago to take Taiwan back. They have tried. They have tried in the 1950s. They were defeated. They have tried to come over to uh, the Taiwan Strait and to take Taiwan back to China. They, they were defeated in 1958. You can check the history. So we, we will try to survive. Thank you for your concern. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, and we'll definitely <laughs> try to make sure that we can help mm, with everything yeah. possible. Mm, mm. Uh, and so I'm still looking at the questions from the audience, and I have one, two, three, and let's go in this order. Mr. Ambassador, you're first. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, the, the uh, Deputy Minister Zhou. Uh, Thank you very much for your uh, detailed explanation and the uh, expression of your uh, explanation of your visions. Uh, for your country as well as the uh, the, uh, the difficult issues surrounding our world. I would like to pick up your one, one of your points uh, where you uh, possibly hinted your kind of aspiration for the increased uh, role of, of the uh, NATO or in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Possibly you didn't say that the, you would like to see a more expanded presence or increased role in the uh, NATO in the Indo-Pacific regions. 
But actually, as you may well uh, be way, uh, as you may well know, that the uh, security, international security arrangement in the uh, Indo-Pacific region is totally different from the uh, NATO uh, system. We are basically including Japan and Korea, of course, including uh, Taiwan. Basically, we are based on the uh, bilateral uh, security arrangement with the U.S. and uh, those. Uh, what should I say, the uh, uh, very strong, tight uh, links between the, the U.S. in the uh, multiple uh, channel or multiple way is the, the uh, strength of the, the, the uh, security arrangement in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in the uh, Far Eastern region. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering how the, uh, your aspiration or your vision, I would say, uh, for, for the uh, increased uh, role in NATO in the Indo-Pacific uh, could be um, could be feasible, or I, I would say would be would be made possible, <laughs> given the uh, the uh, the security arrangement, uh, totally different security arrangement we have already in the region. I'm really just curious if you can elaborate on this point a little bit more. I I really will, would appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you so uh, much, your, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Excellency. Deputy Minister. Maybe we'll take two more questions and then you can answer them all together. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Katarina Švrtnerová, Ministry of Defense of Slovakia. Uh, I wanted to come back a little bit to that um, topic of democratic versus undemocratic camp. Um, I really do have a feeling that while we're all preoccupied with dealing with the uh, Ukrainian crisis and, and the war going on there, um, it's, it's tying all our resources and attention there while there's a bigger game at play uh, all over all over the Europe, trying to divide democratic uh, countries uh, and kind of uh, uh, fragment the democratic camp, uh, so that uh, the, the tandem of China and Russia can can basically dismantle the international order. Um, we see that with uh, Russia uh, destabilizing Africa right now, and um, it's it's a matter also of strategic communication. And I was wondering if. Um, uh, if there's anything that we in Europe or the US or Canada can do to help the rest of the world with strategic communication around Ukraine, for example, because we're kind of losing that uh, battle because the Russian narrative is quite uh, successful over there. And while Ukrainians are doing a pretty good job at trying to communicate like in Latin America or Africa and so on, I don't think that Europe and US are doing that good of a job. So, uh, Deputy Minister, if you have any ideas or, or, or needs that we, we could uh, address uh, in terms of our strategic communication towards our partners all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll take uh, okay. two very big okay. questions. <laughs> enough for uh, me I'm just sorry to pressure, uh, but we'll have to be wrapping up soon. So we'll have to be cautious of time. All right. <laughs> uh, first, uh, I'll try my best to uh, answer the uh, your um, um, ambassador your excellency's questions uh, what i said about the indo-pacific version of nato that that was an argument it was a way reported they say that uh, there is a possibility of this going on but of course this is not in the uh, decision making circle nobody from uh, the indo-pacific is saying that uh, there is an indo-pacific version of nato but uh, the feeling that they are in they are you know, in NATO they are talking about security issues that concerns Indo-Pacific. This is unprecedented. It's only two years ago when NATO have a year uh, political review in London when they first touch upon China. Now they are already you know touching upon Indo-Pacific. This itself I think is significant. And for uh Indo-Pacific you are totally right, it's a very complicated area. N ASEAN is in no way like NATO. Even the Quad, uh, only four countries, even the Quad is not talking about security in the way that it's uh, supposed to be. A lot of people, including Japan, we are hoping that Quad uh, can be a, a framework, but uh, it's very lukewarm from India. India is very different uh, uh, case. So uh, I think uh, it in the Pacific, really, um, from the bottom of my heart, we still need the leadership of United States. I'm very happy to see uh, Japan showing more uh, leadership now. 
very unfortunate to lose a f good friend of uh, Prime Minister Abe, a very good friend of uh, Taiwan people. And uh, just how that is going to um, generate the, the kind of atmosphere in Japan is something we watch very closely. Is it going to uh, generate a momentum to even amend your a uh, peace uh, constitution to allow you to set up, uh, you know, to move military operations abroad. <laughs> that that is something. With I think I think the time will come when Japan and the U U.S. Australia now AUKUS is very important uh, to, to to take up uh, more uh, responsibilities. There were uh, again. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I don't want to get into details. It's going to take up too much time. But to this young lady, uh, I the uh, comparison of democratic versus non-democratic is only a simplified way to describe it. Um, we cannot be too complacent. Yeah, if we count the vote, the like-minded countries may w w will not be a majority. If we vote in the UN, probably uh, it will be China that prevails in many, many cases. But look at what happened after the uh, Ukraine war. Three major uh, votes in the UN context, three times, is an overwhelming uh, support to condemn Russia, and only very few that are against, I mean, in support of Russia, five. Three major votes, but the first one is only five. Of course, with a, a few dozens uh, of stand. But that's a good, very good start. That's a very good start. Um, my take is uh, there is a geopolitical map redrawing itself as a result of the Ukraine war. Uh, and um, NATO has changed with the addition of uh, Sweden and Finland. E EU is going to change. This enlargement of NATO and EU will mean something. And I think something uh, is reinforcing itself among the democratic camp. Let's hope that is the case. But still, we cannot be too complacent. Because China is watching this in from an entirely different perspective. The Chinese leadership is thinking that this is a very optimum time for China to expand. Their, world of, their view of the world is in such a way that they think what is happening in the world is all to the benefit of the Chinese Communist Party. They, they started have, uh, to have this kind of concept when the pandemic erupted in the Europe in, in the w Western countries. When they were the only country who suffered in the early 2020s, they probably are very uh, quiet in thinking about China, uh, you know, have a better model than the Western countries. But now they really think that the Western countries, including the war, I'm sorry to say that, we heard about this, we think this is really wicked uh, to see it that way. They, s they think the war in Ukraine is a war among the white nations. This is the first time the white nations not war with the colonial. It's not the colonial war. And so there is a two nations not involved in that white nations war. They are China and India. So they, they, they are happy about this going on in this part of the war because at the end of the war, it will be a very weakened Russia and a very exhausted Europe or and Europe and America. And who are very happy about this? China and India. They think they will. <laughs> this is a very weak way of looking at that. But it is not right or wrong that matters. The way they interpret it, it would embolden their ambition. That is something concerning to us. So we have really, I think, uh, what is going to decide the future is where we stand, the value we stand. And it's getting more and more difficult to not take sides because uh, you have to show your true color. This is the way of the mainstream. 
And when we take sides, it is the value that decides which side you are. You know, th th for a diplomat, we have no right to be uh, pessimistic. We have no right to pessimism. We always have a vision and we work for the vision. That doesn't mean that we can always succeed. But if we don't succeed in our generation, we have a generation before, behind us, right? And so we, all, we all need to work for what we believe. <laughs> the communists are saying the same thing to them. Good luck for them. But we are, we are doing the same thing. We think, uh, w I think that we are on the side of the human nature, don't you think? <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Deputy Minister. It's a very powerful note to end our conversation. I am afraid we have to <laughs> let you go right now. We know you have an extremely busy schedule. We appreciate your time with us. I particularly loved your concept of French shoring. We're definitely friends and we'll make sure that all our countries will continue working together. Thank you once again and have a wonderful continuation of your trip. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>